Thursday, December 6th. It was going to be my last, last day. I've been here 40 years. How is Eleanor Cross's mission going to be perpetuated? It's just a tremendous legacy. Deep in the Nashua River Valley in north central Massachusetts lies an old mill town. There is a museum in the town, and its story is as unique as its treasures. Fitchburg was a little agricultural town in the 19th century. Then the Industrial Revolution came to Fitchburg because we had a river, and the river provided the power, which in turn provided the electricity to run mills to make textiles. Fitchburg's opportunities drew immigrants from more than 22 countries, including Greece, Italy, France, Germany, and a large number from Finland. By the turn of the century, one-third of Fitchburg's population was foreign-born. In 1873, Fitchburg elected its first mayor, Amasa Norcross, a lawyer and former state representative. His daughter, Eleanor, was a teenager at the time. She came up through a difficult childhood in which her brother died when she was 11. Her mother also died when she was a teenager. So it was just her father, who was a prominent businessman and political and social leader, and herself. She was kind of a rebel in that she was very interested in the arts. It was not a ladylike thing to be supporting yourself, especially by painting. So her father allowed her to paint, but he continued to support her. She studied painting with William Merritt Chase in New York and eventually went to Paris and settled there for quite a while. She developed the idea of bringing the important cultural ideas that she was experiencing in Paris back to her hometown, back to Fitchburg. She spent a lot of time in the Louvre painting its interiors, these paintings she lent to the Fitchburg Public Library. Many of those paintings would have showed prints, rugs, furniture, ceramics, glass, the kinds of elegant decorative motifs that were present in upper class homes. Eleanor Norcross was, as far as we know, the first American ever to have an exhibition in the Louvre. She looked to the French Impressionists, and in her best paintings, she has a very lively and uh, spirited take on Impressionism. She exhibited all over the world and never could make a living at this because women didn't make a living at art at that time. Eleanor, in spite of being a very worldly young woman, came back to Fitchburg very often. She was alive to the spirit of her time and she was alive to some of the most innovative cultural ideas of her time. And those ideas she wanted her community, her home community, to know about. In 1923, she was in Fitchburg when she became very ill. Eleanor Norcross died in her home in Fitchburg in 1923 and bequeathed her collections of European art and classical antiquities and her own paintings to start an art center in Fitchburg. Her collections would come to Fitchburg provided the city raised $10,000. People in Fitchburg did raise the, the money, and they purchased the Cross Barn, which they then renovated in French provincial style in honor of Eleanor Norcross. And the Art Center opened in 1927. The center was founded so that the young people of her native place would come to know the joy and inspiration of art. But just six years after the Fitchburg Art Center opened its doors, tragedy struck. There was a wood frame house behind the museum. Someone came in, into the house and upset a lantern, and the house burned down. The fire spread to the museum and gutted the entire thing, destroying the, the collection. It was a Devastating in, in just so many ways. The, the exhibition that the museum was showing at the time was Fitchburg's Treasures. And the director had asked uh, the members of the Art Center to share uh, with the public the things they valued the most. And all those things were put into the museum, if you can imagine. 
and uh, that's what, what burned down. Quite a bit was salvaged, stored in a warehouse, and that had a fire. So it was really two fires in um, a very short period of time. Probably two-thirds to three-quarters of the Eleanor Norcross paintings that were stored and exhibited at the museum at that time were lost in the fire. The fire was a blow to Fitchburg, which was also immersed in the Great Depression. Throughout the 30s, factories closed because of the Great Depression. When they reopened, reopened in the South, not here. By the 1940s, Fitchburg residents were back to work in the remaining factories. The mill town had grown into a thriving industrial city. Like the city, the Art Center rebounded under its director, Zadie Harris. In Fitchburg terms, she was legendary. She had immense character her, herself. She always looked very artistic. She felt that here was somebody that was a presence. Working with Zadie Harris was really fun. She was eccentric in her own way. Obviously, I never knew Eleanor Norcross, but Zadie seemed as if she might have been cut out of the same cloth. Zadie was a very creative person in her own right. She was the boss. She was smart. She moved in the right circles. Most of the people that came to the Fitchburg Art Museum in the 50s were people who had businesses and owned the factories and the companies. It had a dedicated coterie of women volunteers. They were responsible for the biggest fundraiser of all, which was a giant rummage sale. The galleries would be given over to collecting old clothes. The exhibition program was mostly showing local artists. It was a pretty quiet place. By the late 1960s, demand for papers and textiles declined, and more and more factories left Fitchburg. The younger generations also moved out of the region, and Fitchburg's industry and economy were in decline. The Fitchburg Art Museum was also in the midst of a transition, as Zadie Harris retired. The search was on for a new director. A young archaeologist and marine named Peter Timms applied for the job. I remember going to meet the, the new director of the Fitchburg Art Museum and thinking, gee, I wonder what kind of individual would take a job like this. He was an archaeologist. He got a, a PhD from Harvard in archaeology. Before starting his archaeological career in Paleolithic sites of southwestern France, Peter Timms had served in Vietnam, participating in over 100 combat patrols in the late 1960s. After teaching English in the Middle East, he returned to the States to study archaeology. While I was a, a graduate student, rather than looking at, uh, for teaching positions, I looked at um, museums. And having been through the service, um, I decided that I didn't want to start at the bottom. I was very sure of myself and felt that I wanted to be a director. That judgment was not shared by many. Um, and I probably had a stack of rejections about 14 inches um, high on my, my table when uh, I learned of this position out here in, in Fitchburg. I was just 40 miles from Boston. I had always been looking at, at natural history museums because of my interest in, in archaeology. I've always loved art. Um, when I was in the service and stationed outside Washington, I'd be in the National Gallery every, every weekend. My wife's an artist. I remember meeting him, and he came across as very understated. Months later, I decided I had it all wrong. Peter had the same kind of enthusiasm that Zadie had, but in an entirely different way. You just knew that Peter was going to energize the art museum and lead it in a new direction and be open to new ideas. The new director inherited a community museum with virtually no endowment or clear mission in a declining town. The overriding challenge was to make a relatively small art museum in a relatively small community relevant. 
Why bother? Why have it? What, what does it contribute? The challenges that Peter faced, one of the major ones was fundraising and trying to build up the endowment. They really wanted a builder. They wanted someone to develop what they, what they had. I felt that I could, could do that. Not all of his efforts were met with enthusiasm. Zadie lived across the street from the museum, and after every trustee meeting, a little coterie of, of women would report to Zadie what latest outrage that the new director had, had uh, performed. I painted this one wall a very intense, bright yellow. And my God, you'd think that I'd just defaced the Mona Lisa or something. It was just sacrilege, the, the kind of changes that, that I made. One of Peter's first goals was to grow the museum's collection. He cultivated collectors and developed private sources of funding. He secured long-term loans from museums and brought in adjunct curators for special exhibitions. I mounted an exhibition of Picasso prints that were lent by New England collectors. I think Peter's goal was to let the community know that even in their hometown, uh, they could find high quality art. I was inspired by Peter and his optimism and his vision, uh, wanting to turn this little museum with some real jewels into an important regional presence. As the collection grew and became more valuable, it needed better conservation, better care. Everything just began to outgrow the building it was in. Peter felt very strongly that the museum should serve an important educational role. In order to do that, the footprint needed to be expanded. The way we achieved that space was to acquire a small commercial building at the other end of the block. Under Peter's leadership, the museum raised $2.5 million, one of the largest amounts ever raised in Fitchburg. Peter cultivated some major donors who in turn made gifts the size of which none of us could have anticipated. None of us other than Peter Timms. He knew what he was doing. From 1987 to 1989, the museum renovated the commercial structure and built the Harlan K. and L.C.D. Simons building to create a block-long connected complex of 12 galleries. The museum quadrupled in size, from 10,000 to 40,000 square feet. Peter turned the museum's efforts more and more toward education. I think Peter's background as an anthropologist gave him a natural interest in art of the ancient world. The collection grew to accommodate some of the curriculum of the public school system, and which is why the Egyptian gallery became such an important part of the museum. We wanted to develop a tomb shaft as an approach for the um, Egyptian gallery. We approached my wife, Romaine, and so she recreated the Book of the Dead on one wall, then recreated on the other wall an introduction to all the, the gods that you would see as you walk down in, into the tomb. And this dovetails well with the curriculum in the school, so it's a natural place for teachers to bring their students. I was approached by the school superintendent. They had identified about 30 children. They were fifth graders, and they were cutting school about 50% of the time. Teachers had identified these children as so-called visual learners. They developed their, their, a curriculum that was called object-based learning. The idea was that children would study all of their lessons, reading, writing, science, math, everything through art. Art that they produced and art that they would study. Its approach was basically interdisciplinary. Children got to see where science and math and English could overlap through looking at objects. If one were to take a Greek vase, the child would learn about how the actual vase was shaped and then they would learn about the actual figure, if it was Hercules. They would also learn about how this actual vase was used. In math and science, they would learn about proportion. They would learn about volume. This one object was teaching them multiple things. 
When Peter wanted to start the school, he hired um, a very experienced art historian and museum educator, Roger Dell, to help guide that process. We started out grades six through eight here in the museum. The city gave us a building, and that building, interestingly enough, was Eleanor Norcross's high school. And we expanded to 200 children. And at that point, they came from 27 communities, and we were at grades five through eight. The school based its curriculum around things at the museum. Unlike any museum, the decisions, what we collected and what we exhibited were made not by godlike curators, they were made by the teachers. We would present the teachers with lists of possibilities. It didn't matter what they, they selected from that list, we would be proud to have the show. We called ourselves uh, a museum with a school at its heart. It was the only partnership in the country between a private art museum and a public school system. I felt the museum was certainly fulfilling the intent of Eleanor Norcross, but it went so far beyond. I mean, there were times where you just wished Eleanor Norcross could be back here and to see the place filled with children and learning not just art, but just learning all the subjects in, a, in an academic curriculum. One of our students was an eighth grader, and in a room full of adults, he stood up and said, I am a fashion designer. I had a fashion show at one point, and a fashion illustrator spent a day with this boy. And she said to me, you keep your eye on that kid. He is really good. A survey showed that children who were exposed to the program here at the Fitchburg Art Museum stayed in school longer, did better at their studies, missed fewer days of school, and generally were just better students. Kids who had not attended school 50% of the time under the old system were attending our school 98% uh, of the time. It was quite stunning that families who lived outside of Worcester would actually pay tuition to the city of Fitchburg to bring their children into the program. The school's reach went beyond Massachusetts. New York's famed Lincoln Center, after learning of the curriculum from Roger Dell, designated the Museum Partnership School a focus school. And this would be their first focus school outside uh, the boroughs of New York. And for a number of years, um, our teachers would train in the summer at Lincoln Center. The, the educational challenges were the, relatively the easiest. The hardest were the political challenges. School committee is an elected body and convincing an elected body that they ought to do things that are not very traditional, not always the easiest thing to do. Fitchburg itself, the economy was starting to go south and I'm afraid the school became one of the, the casualties. When the school closed, it absolutely broke my heart. It was just devastating. It was just taking the guts right out of the museum. It's really how did it affect those children who genuinely had a home here, whom American education, in, in my judgment, is, is failing. To have a school inside a museum was very special. Those children are not being served. Those children are still presumably keeping quiet if they're really interested in, in fashion design. There were times after Peter was the director when I began wondering who would stay, who would put up with the difficulties of building a museum or raising huge amounts of money to make it bigger and better. And I guess maybe it was the perseverance he learned as a Marine. He was a captain in the Marine Corps and he had very significant and challenging battlefield experience. I think seeing what happens in conflict inspired him to want to come to a museum like Fitchburg and to build something that could be a really positive cultural setting for people to experience ideas and concepts that are really important in building culture in a society and in maintaining the whole notion of a higher order of thinking that hopefully keeps us out of conflict. Uh, Peter's a tremendous leader in that regard. Look at this, isn't this lovely?
I had a number of invitations to um, consider uh, becoming the director of other institutions. And it was one of those moments where you really did some soul searching. Romain and I both felt that the opportunity to create something here was just wonderful. And why walk away from it? The Fitchburg Art Museum is also in very good financial shape compared to many community art museums that are struggling. The museum's endowment grew from $200,000 in the 1970s to $17 million in 2012. The funds increased the museum's programs and collections. Today, the museum's galleries feature American, European, African, Egyptian, Greek, Roman, Asian, and pre-Columbian art. Museums ultimately, large and small, are known by the masterpieces that they have. With fairly limited resources, Peter has been able to not only cultivate and take care of the great works of art that are in the museum, but to add to them. One of the key acquisitions that Peter made was of a wonderful, early, a William Merritt Chase painting. And this painting comes from the exact time that Eleanor Norcross was working with and studying with William Merritt Chase. The Joseph Wright of Derby portrait of Sarah Clayton is a magnificent painting. It might be the best Wright of Derby portrait in North America. Mrs. Mellon gave the fabulous pictures in the Mellon collection. The wonderful and very intimate Edward Wiard painting and the beautiful Fantin Latour flower picture. And of course, that sunny day on the Riviera that Roald Dufy painted. One of the things about Edward Hopper is that he had trouble climbing out from his personal states of depression. And when he did, the paintings that he did in those moments of enlightened and enthusiastic energy are the best of his career. And when he painted the Fitchburg Art Museum's watercolor, that was a magic moment in his life and a magic moment on paper for Edward Hopper. The Rockwell Kemp painting of Mount Monadnock is a masterpiece of American modernist painting. That particular painting shows the artist in the full bloom of his most ambitious period of work. And over the years, the museum has produced hundreds of exhibitions. The exhibition program was really important in terms of the audience in West Central Massachusetts. But more than that, he brought so many exhibitions to the Fitchburg Art Museum that were of state, regional, national, and even international significance. One of the most important exhibitions that Peter did in terms of national and international outreach was the Kilns of Denmark exhibition. The show traveled to New York, San Diego, Paris, Berlin, and Fitchburg. My all-time favorite exhibition was called the Tureen. Peter organized an exhibition about a soup serving bowl that was part of Eleanor Norcross's collection. We examined the artwork. We showed the cornucopia going back actually to Paleolithic times. We talked about the conversations that the Tureen could have overheard, the political climate. We gave recipes for soup that the Tureen would have held. We talked about what was the best ceramic. Well, the best ceramic was, was porcelain. Where did porcelain come from? Well, it came from China. And then you walked across a hall into the second gallery. And the first thing you saw was this tureen just suspended in three-dimensional space. And it was a hologram. Computers were just coming into our culture. And we had a CAD scan, and it was showing how you could precisely draw this terrain in three-dimensional space. It had been mended in the 19th century and it had huge staples in it. We were able to Photoshop the staples out. And then we'd say to children, well, um, we're going to publish a catalog. Which photograph would you use? Well, inevitably, they would say, well, use the one without the staples. And we'd say, well, yes, but suppose you've come from California just to see this terrain. All you know is the picture of it, and suddenly you see it. There it is with staples. We were talking about reality and how reality changes and how you can manipulate reality. And these were concepts that we talked about, which we felt would be 21st century concepts, which, which are, which we exposed children to, just through this one object. 
Today, the museum attracts nearly 4,000 children from over 20 school districts. Now, of course, because the schools are not able to provide as much art ed education as they used to, uh, it falls to the museum to take as much responsibility as possible. The role of a, of a community museum is, is the same, really, um, as the role of a, of a metropolitan museum for a metropolitan area. Fitchburg is a microcosm of a large city. The social structure is the same. The role is the same. It's largely an educational role to preserve and interpret works of art that otherwise would not be saved or preserved or interpreted in a society. Community museums are important because they're accessible. Kids who might not set foot in a museum do so, and they find that it's a fun place. They might say to their parents, hey, let's go check out and see what's happening at the art museum. Our museum is a window. A child will see perhaps the first Greek vase they will ever see, the first painting they will ever see. Certainly they can go on to another institution and see more of these things, and hopefully they will. But they're going to be introduced to that, that world, that subject, here at the Fitchburg Art Museum. Creative thinking, which is an area in which America has traditionally excelled, is nurtured by an understanding appreciation of the arts, where you see that things are not always certainties, uh, and that there are many approaches to solving a problem. The Fitchburg Art Museum has kind of proved its point right now, and people are beginning to recognize that an arts community can be a big asset to a city. I think a lot of people could look at Fitchburg as a faded mill town without much promise, but the Fitchburg Art Museum kind of has kept the cultural core of Fitchburg thriving and intact and has really contributed to a resurgence of activities and sort of positive growth in the community. In the 1970s, 1,100 people visited the art museum each year. In 2012, 25,000 people walked through the museum's doors. In December 2012, Peter Timms retired after nearly 40 years as director of the Fitchburg Art Museum, the longest tenure of a museum director in New England's history. November 10th, the Marine Corps birthday and the day of his grand farewell party has been declared Peter Timms Day in Fitchburg. Peter Timms has really made the Fitchburg Art Museum what it is today, and he took a small building and an interesting collection and he transformed it and conceptualized the role for it to be a very broad role in the community particularly through its education programs and particularly through seeing it as a meeting place as a gathering place for the community that was a unique vision that he brought to the community. And I like to think of him really as a shaman of, of Fitchburg, you know, that, that, that a shaman is someone that, that is a spirit leader who gathers people together and, and, and explores their deepest longings and their deepest fears. He's unique. Uh, I think there are very few people who have in our time served that long and accomplished that much. Nicholas Capasso, former director of the DeCorva Sculptural Park and Museum in Lincoln, Massachusetts, was named the new director of the Fitchburg Art Museum. The Fitchburg Art Museum is a real gem of New England museums. And Eleanor Norcross and Peter Timms, people from two different generations, are the visionaries who created this masterpiece, this, this masterpiece in a mill town.